Hey everybody, uh, this is uh, Mark Clements here, Artistic Director at Milwaukee Rep, uh, calling from home. Uh, and uh, my guest today for the What's the Tea series is Lee Ernst, um, uh, an actor who will be very, very familiar to, and beloved actor, familiar to our audiences. He was uh, part of Milwaukee Rep for 20 years. Um, we had a little discussion before we came on. He thinks it's a minimum of 85 productions that he appeared in, but it could be more. Um, welcome, Lee. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Mark. Um, really very pleased to be here. And, and in front of the Milwaukee audience again. It's touching. And, and nationally as well. And what? <laughs> Oh, national. Yes. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, we're, we're going everywhere. We're, we're going every, everywhere where anyone wants to tune in and, and listen to us, which is awesome. Uh, well, this series, you know, is called What's the Tea? Because, um, you know, it's a, a, a phrase that the younger people use for what's the gossip. Um, but it's also um, pertains to my British roots and having a cup of tea where we uh, the neighbors come in, they have a cup of tea, they talk about the uh, problems of the day, uh, they drink their tea and then they go back about their business. It's a very traditional sort of British pastime. Um, probably more of yesteryear than now, but perhaps who knows that we'll come back into fashion. First off, um, you know, I'm drinking today, I'm, I'm on the herbal tea today. I say herbal now because I'm an American Brit uh, rather than herbal, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm on the ginger and lemon. Uh, which I'm finding is uh, keeping me in good order throughout this pandemic. What have you got there? Well, I have herbal as well, uh, chamomile. I'm typically a coffee drinker and uh, one cup a day coffee drinker because I, I get the yips, I get the, uh, the twitches from too much caffeine. So I'm doing uh, chamomile and I want to tell you about my cup. Please do. Uh, it just occurred to me yesterday that this being the middle of May and 2020, it was exactly 25 years ago, almost to the day, when I was with, yes, I was, I was with Milwaukee Rep in 1995, and a group of us went to Siberia. And uh, it was part of an exchange that had been prearranged before I was uh, brought into the company. And one night at our little hotel in Omsk, Siberia, uh, some person I had never met before, he was an actor, uh, there to see the final lineup of the season at the Omsk State Drama Theater. He had taken a train from Novosibirsk. He wanted to talk to me. And so he invited me to his room and we drank vodka, far too much vodka for anyone to consume. And I, I think we went into the night till about three or four in the morning. It was the worst alcohol uh, experience I have ever had. When we got to the end of our conversation, he said, so Lee, you are Hector, I am Hector. Uh, you, you, um, you know American film, you know Bruce Willis, I look like Bruce Willis. You will tell Bruce about Oleg. And um, I said, I don't know Bruce Willis personally. He said, yes, you know Bruce. I said, I don't know him personally. And he, he insisted I did. I finally had to just tell him that if I ever saw Bruce Willis, I would uh, tell him about Oleg. And Oleg gave me this cup as a parting gift and I don't think I've ever had a cup of tea in it before. So, <laughs> cheers, Oleg. Yeah, cheers, Oleg. Oleg Strovia. Yeah, there's no, maybe uh, you, it would be even better with a slug of um, uh, Siberian vodka in it. Oh, yikes. Not as I Well, you know what they're doing now. Um, people are, are taping the tea tag to the inside of their cup with the tag hanging out for Zoom meetings and putting wine in the cup, of course. <laughs> so Why they didn't I think of that? Them. Why didn't I think of that? That seems a great idea, given the amount of Zoom meetings I'm on every week. Um, I'm the sure. option is available. I wouldn't use the clear mug, though. Yeah, yeah, that one, yeah, well, that might be a giveaway, yeah. 
Um, first off, um, you know, we're thrilled uh, that you'll be returning uh, to the Pabst Theatre uh, in our production of uh, Christmas Carol um, in this new version that uh, I've written, which has been up and running for about four or five years now. Um, you've played Scrooge before and you've been in numerous other roles in Christmas Carol over the years. Yeah. Uh, what else have you played in, in the annual production of Christmas Carol? I, I reckon I've been in Milwaukee Rep's Christmas Carol about at least a dozen times. So yes, I've played Scrooge. I have played young Scrooge, played uh, Marley, um, old Joe, uh, Dick Wilkins, Pummel Tyke twice, Topper, uh, Flip Field, I, just just a host of uh, wow. most most of the men, I think. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're we're absolutely thrilled, as indeed our audience are, um, with the news that you're coming back, uh, back to Milwaukee Rep uh, to see you on our stages again. Um, I'm very excited to work with you on that and uh, hear you speaking uh, the, the Scrooge words and. Uh, uh, and it will be a joyous and beautiful thing. So we're very excited about that. Thank um, you. Just tell me, like, uh, since you were last here at Milwaukee Rep, um, you've been uh, a member of uh, uh, an acting member and you teach at Delaware Rep. Tell us a bit about the work that you've been doing in Delaware since uh, you left uh, Milwaukee. Sure. Yeah, this is the... Um the end of our, my seventh season with this company that's been around for um, 11 seasons now. Um, so I've, I've been able to play about 30 plus roles, um, which makes me think my Milwaukee rep count is even higher, must be. Um, so it's, it's been exciting um, just to continue working as an actor is always exciting. Uh, one of the great benefits for me of, of uh, being out here has been the crossover between rep, uh, Milwaukee rep directors and designers and artists who um, also work with this theater. So even though it was, uh, it was hard to leave our beloved home in Milwaukee. It, um, it was also a comfort to be in the company of those people on a regular basis. So in addition to um, acting in all these shows, I've always uh, also been the fight director, which I also did at Milwaukee Rep. I have um, uh, continued as a makeup specialist when they need prosthetics or anything fun or some old age makeup. Um, that kind of thing. And most recently, I've taken a few classes in uh, intimacy direction. So I am not an intimacy director or coach at this point. I am, I guess, what is being considered an advocate, which um, for those who don't know, when there are scenes of any degree of contact or intimacy on stage, there's a bit of a new, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, just a new model for dealing with that specialty, that special need in productions that allows the actors to have a voice and to be able to feel confident that they are actually consenting to all of the behavior that they're engaged in on stage. So it, it, it helps us to avoid um, concerning situations after the fact. Thank you. Well, and that's an interesting question I was gonna ask you later in this interview, but um, you know, as we segue uh, coming back to our theaters, please God, um, soon. Yeah. The whole degree of, uh, of intimacy in the way that you have just described it uh, pertaining to, uh, you know, kissing sexual acts that we're simulating uh, on stage. You know, the whole word of like intimacy with, with actors um, never meant, you know, anything like six feet apart. And now that's the sort of thing that we are suddenly involved with this pandemic, um, you know, whether we go to the supermarket, uh, when we interact with our neighbor or whatever, that's gonna bring on a whole new raft of questions. And, um, you know, there's two issues it seems that we're dealing with in the theater right now. 
uh, certainly with places like Milwaukee Rep and, and my counterparts around the country, is one is the compatibility of, act, uh, of audiences when they come back. Mm-hmm. How we will be uh, uh, seated. What will we? What tests will we be doing? Will we be checking people's temperatures? Will how many additional forms of sanitizers will we be hand sanitizers? Will we be offering people in the way that you know you can pick up a, a cloth and wipe your supermarket cart down? What will happen now? With will you be doing the same with the, your seat to make you as comfortable as possible in that uh, while we work this situation out? Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's the other side, you know, which is really what I'm focused very much on now with my counterparts about actors. Um, and not just actors, how do you do a quick change? How do you have the haircut that you need for the show? Uh, a makeup artist that is applying a specialist makeup to you. All of those things require being two inches away. And whilst we see that some states are actually opening up uh, already, places uh, that do that, haircuts, tattoo parlors, um, the question is, are people going to be flooding back even if those places are open? Will actors be as willing? Um, okay, will the equity, the our union, uh, actors union, be able to uh, be feel that's safe for actors to, to be able to do that? What are the conversations you've been having with your contemporaries or, and, and and your organization or, around <laughs> that very thing? What are you, where are you, you know? Tell us some of the, the conversations you've been having. Um, well, uh, I guess we really haven't gotten that far, or at least uh, the the conversation that would treat on that specific need, that specific concern has not yet included me. Um, I think we're more focused right now on how do we get content out in the meantime? What form does that take? What is the union involvement? What are, what's the red tape? How do we, how do we do this effectively and cleanly? Um, I know that uh, Sandy Robbins and my wife, uh, in addition to other staff members are, are working on multiple scenarios to, um, to project what we are going to do scheduling wise, certainly. If not this, then what? And if not that, then what? Uh, just multiple contingencies. When it comes right down to the nuts and bolts of uh, engagement, I guess, I, I, so much for us right now is unknown. I mean, for us at large is unknown that it's it's hard to put a plan in place for tomorrow if uh, tomorrow the rules are going to be totally different. So we, I don't know that anybody's anticipated that yet, but it is uh, publicly or, or organizationally. Yeah, it's, 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 there's no answer to it right now because it, could, it the notion of theater being the ultimate shared experience is, yep. is, is uh, just being turned on its head about how we do that. You know, I was, into, I was interviewing uh, Rob McClure, mm-hmm. uh, who's a Philadelphia-based actor and um, playing um, uh, Mrs. Doubtfire in the Broadway production of Mrs. Doubtfire, and, you know, where that, that production got um, postponed uh, after its third preview. And Rob, you know, cited this, example of it you know at the end of the uh, spoiler alert here i guess but you know at the end of the the show when the character reveals who he really is um and picks up his child in his arm and embraces this child actor on stage in this beautiful moment um is there how do you replicate that You, you can't replicate that moment which is the defining moment of the show so until there's a place where we, those actors feel comfortable and it's safe enough to do that, either through knowing more about this awful virus, uh, the implications, uh, do we create immunity for ourselves if we've had it? Ultimately, when we testing is available for everybody, will we find out that millions and millions and millions of people have had it and actually we're just hearing about the severe case. You know, we just don't know. But Rob's point was like, 
I don't know, until we're able to do that moment, should we even be trying to do that? It doesn't mean that we don't do anything else. I think we have to keep in touch with our audiences. We're looking at not trying to replicate. You know, I've heard some critics and some people, you know, being very denigrating the efforts that are being, of people being, putting stuff online. Uh, I guess it it comes from, it depends where you come from. As an organization, I know that we provide a huge amount of comfort. We're not trying to replicate the experience of live theater. We're looking at alternative ways of keeping our audience in touch and telling them that we care about them. Um, And that has a transactional and a non-transactional point of view. I think artists are inherently wired to create. So we want to create. Um, so somebody passing a judgment from a creative field on somebody else creating mm-hmm. is kind of annoying to me. It's, I, I, you know, and I, you know, I think there are, everyone can make a judgment call on whether they're streaming their show with, uh, you know, multiple cameras, uh, like the national theater and doing it really well, or, you know, is there a difference between that than sticking a cam, you know, an iPhone at the back of an auditorium and then, you know, projecting that, put streaming that and asking people to pay for that. Look, I think we're doing what, what we can do to survive right now. And there's no cut and dry answers, but um, it seems to me that keeping in touch with people has been what we're hearing. This sort of thing that we're doing today is requ- is, is people are interested to hear what we're thinking about. Those of us that are involved in, the theater at the very deepest level, at the creative level, at the organizational level, and and interested to know what we're talking about because I think it's a way of offering hope and everybody's, one one thing we're really finding is that we're really, really missing it. Everybody's missing creating it, um, earning a living from it, watching it, you name it. Um, I think everything uh, that has to do with that uh, has got to be, but, it's got to be incremental because there you need to be aware of safety every step of the way. And so right now we are, we are making the measured steps that we can take. And um, it's about our network. It's about our family as community is family. And in my, my personal family, my wife and my kids and my grandkids, being together as a family means hugging and mussing up the hair and playing games and all of that kind of thing. Um, and it's not the same thing when we do a Zoom chat with the family, but right now it's the best thing we've got. And so we change the relativity of it comes into play. And so we, we, we settled for something. We know there's something out there that's better that we've experienced, that we love, that we strive and yearn for. And it will come back at some point, somehow, but uh, to, uh, it's really hard to project. Yeah, I think it's really important that, you know, organizations are able to keep us strong. I think that's why keeping in touch with our, our donor bases and our trustees and our stakeholders uh, in the places we live, and not, not just from a fiscal point of view, uh, is is vital actually, uh, because <clears throat> the things that define us, what we love about um, our cities, that where we live, the things that we usually we expect a certain prerequisite quality of healthcare and uh, or available healthcare or recreational facilities, parks. Um, places, uh, hopefully decent schooling. Those are things that seem to be prerequisites for defining a city and its strength or weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it's the arts and the things that, those are the things that define the character of a city. Uh, Laurence Olivier once said, a a city with a theater, without a theater doesn't have a heart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, that's coming from a very theater centric point of view, but I, I think the, whether it's a theater or a ballet company or a symphony orchestra, uh, the arts in general, live, visual, um, they are the things that define the character and the fabric of the city, the things that we love and enjoy. So making sure we preserve those things for when we're able to come back and enjoy them again in the shared true version of the shared experience um, is going to be, I think, a... Uh, a glorious moment and a very important moment and the actions in which we take right now 
to safeguard those uh, things and putting it out there so that people who do have the means to help that, whether it be through organizational or fiscal, is going to be very, very vital uh, because it's inevitable that some companies will fall to the wayside mm -hmm. and we have to preserve as much of that as possible amidst this dreadful crisis, whilst obviously we prioritize on healthcare workers and our emergency services and all the things that are going to literally keep us alive if we get sick, God forbid. Um, what are, you know, what are the things that are mostly keeping you awake at night right now? Well, I'm, hmm. I uh, listened to some of your previous conversations with folks and um, I was struck by Molly, Molly Smith, who I, I never met her, but I thoroughly enjoyed the interview. Um, but when, when you were talking about this very thing, she said, I, I don't listen to the news. I don't listen to Rachel anymore. I can't, I have to stop that. And that's constant to and fro for me. I, I really feel that of any time uh, I've been alive, this is a time when I need to continue being informed. And granted, what you get if you turn on any of the news channels 24-7, um, you're going to get a lot of repetition. So I'm trying to keep that in balance. Uh, I am concerned for my children, for my family primarily. Uh, you know, it doesn't stop there, but it's got to start there. And uh, it doesn't keep me up at night. It um, makes me makes me hopeful. I think just seeing how they deal with uh, these these existential issues is um, it's powerful. Uh, sorry, I'm getting emotional. Well, why wouldn't you? You know, I mean, it is. You know, I, I suddenly think about my eight-year-old daughter, you know, which is, I'm blessed in some ways that she's not 18 and just trying to go to university or something right now, which is, must be bringing an incredible amount of stress to the, those kids who work so hard and are just about to move to the next stage. And who knows whether that's going to happen. And, you know, uh, so hopefully time is on Amelie, my daughter's uh, side there, but I just see how much she's missing at eight years old, her fam, her friends and uh, the contact, you know, she's finally been able to be reunited with her grandmother after we've all acted strictly strict quarantine. And so that's been a great thing who she just got in. My mother got in from the UK and is now living here and just in the nick of time. So, but I look at, you know, her Emily, how she's just missing the interaction on a day-to-day -day basis with her teachers and her friends. And they're doing an incredible job, those teachers, you know, trying to keep them yes. engaged. But it, 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 I suddenly thought about the hard facts of it the other day and it really upset me, you know, just like what she's missing. And she can't even fully, at her age, fully articulate that or understand the full implications of the time she's missing. Um, and so it's just devastating even on <clears throat> those levels that actually don't seem immediately apparent in the middle of a day. Um, it is subjective. I mean, for a, for a child that age, of course, it's a, yeah. it's a chunk of, of life. For an adult, it's just seeing the world in a different shape. Uh, I think one of the, I think there are many benefits. I think there are many things to be grateful for as paradoxical or even perverse as that sounds. Um, I've been taking walks out. There's a state park just two miles from here and it's quite beautiful. And I've uh, been walking my dog there regularly and um, I'm hearing things I've never heard before. I'm seeing in a way I haven't seen before. I see the distance between people and I know that when we get to experience something approaching what we had before that our appreciation for the life that's available to us uh, i expect it to be profound and and um affect the audiences in really a monumental way um and add 
just a, a hugely greater significance or re-realization of what it means to be um, a community. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking, I was, we were having a conversation here this morning just about what will that moment be, you know, when we, you know, a large scale company can link hands four feet away from the audience, unmasked, taking a company bow. God. Can you imagine that? Like what we like what that is. What it will be like to be in a stadium full of hot, sweaty people watching someone like Bruce Springsteen or the Foo Fighters, uh, and just having that experience. I, I I hope that I'm I'm I have to be positive about what that will be and that will be possible. Yeah. And I'm put it, putting my faith in humanity i'm putting my faith in our scientists Scientists. to help us be able to do that again and sooner than later and and i'm encouraged by what i'm reading Mm -hmm. Uh, i hope it's affordable for everybody because if it isn't that won't work because this damn disease is not selective on whether you're a billionaire or a homeless person and that's something i think that is waking us up let me segue to a final question for you. I hate the term silver linings. I've always like, cause it always felt like it was part of a, you know, a telling off, you know, when I was miserable. Well, think about your silver linings, but for one of a better phrase, what are the things that have uh, positive things you have got through this, uh, through this experience in terms of maybe resetting you from a, both an industry point of view or a personal point of view? What are the things that have, um, uh, giving you a sense of hope. You did it. You just alluded to one just now, but um, you know, has it? <laughs> I know that some people are talking about uh, they binge watched uh, all the Netflix and HBO series. I haven't been able to have the capacity to, uh, mentally by that time of the day when I'm free to do that to be able to do that. Um, but well, what you know, have you gone back into making bread? or cake that you never did before. What have, what's your, what's been your jam, you know, your silver lining? Well, do you know, uh, my jam has, has what I've spent my uh, productive hours doing is uh, providing PPE. Um, the company here has, uh, we've got over 50 people uh, from the company who are making masks and uh, supplying those. I think they've, supplied, made and supplied over 1,500 masks at this point, um, a few hundred shields that they're in production with now. Um, I have a friend in Milwaukee whose mother was a rep subscriber, Laura Achen. Uh, she's no longer with us, but uh, Chris has been uh, making masks for the last month, uh, month and a half, and he's involved me in it. So he sends me the the raw stuff after it's 3D printed off the line, and um, I package it all, and I I provide local hospitals um, with with this. I've sent out over 600 thus far. Uh, I'll have close to a thousand out next week. That to me is a positive, um, it's, it's not, oh joy, but it makes me feel good to be part of at least some form of, of a short-term solution, helping the people who are doing the frontline work. So that, that takes my mind off, off the negative, uh, at least for a couple hours a day. Um, other than that, uh, I've reconnected with my siblings in a, in a very significant way. I've got my high school class <laughs> is now starting to hold Zoom reunions. Um, it, I'm going to have to start being selective about who gets on the dance card pretty soon, but um, I'm, I'm certainly enjoying that. Um, and it just reinforces the common humanity aspect of what we do in the theater. And it's just a reflection of who we are as people, um, what, our, what our needs are, and we're providing, um, we're providing for each other. So that to me is, is maybe a golden lining. Well, that's a beautiful 
and positive note, as I hope these um, series of interviews uh, will come out of them. That's what I hope. And that's a beautiful uh, point to end on. Um, Lee, it's been fantastic to see your face again. Yeah, likewise. Uh, I can't wait to uh, be in the room uh, with you again, um, uh, you know, later on this year, God willing. And, um, and uh, you know, I hope to be in a place where we can actually hug each other uh, rather than having six feet distance. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I wish you and all the family, Sandy and everybody, all the Sandys in Delaware, uh, yes. well. And um, we are excited to see you back and cheers. Well, love to you and Kelly and Amelie and all my friends in Milwaukee and at the Rep. You got it, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers.